Good afternoon. I must say that I'm very happy to see so many young Israeli students among the audience here. It really makes me uh, very happy. You are the future of the university, and I welcome you to the symposium. I'm not going to give a long speech. I'm happy to open the symposium uh, on ancient DNA. And I uh, just would like to introduce shortly uh, our two guests, laureates of Dan David Prize. The first is Svante Pabo, sitting here with us. He is the uh, director of the Department of Genetics at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. Uh, Pabo is known as one of the founders of paleogenetics, a discipline that uses the methods of genetics to study early humans and other ancient populations. In addition, in, he and his team are developing novel methods for ancient DNA analysis. Among his research, I would like to mention uh, his work, his first uh, significant work, um, where he managed to successfully uh, sequencing of uh, Neanderthal mitochondrial uh, DNA. Later on, uh, he was uh, the first uh, uh, to analyze from a single finger bone uh, DNA of what we, know, we, we now know as Homo Denisovian from a cave in Siberia. And uh, later on, he published the first draft, uh, uh, draft sequence of uh, the whole uh, Neanderthal uh, genome. Sitting just uh, next to him is David, professor at uh, the Department of Genetics at Harvard uh, University Medical School. And just to mention a few of his uh, studies, the first one, the split between uh, human and chimpanzee lineage uh, long ago, between 6 to 6.3 to 4 to 5.4 million years, which do not coincide with the fossil records, uh, constructing the biological history of the Indian population, uh, the findings that Neanderthal and Denisovans interbreed with human population as they dispersed from Africa into Eurasia 40 to 80,000 years ago, and now his current studies on population movement, migration, and uh, dispersal in the last uh, few years. We will uh, start with uh, Svante Pablo lecture for 30 to 40 minutes, followed by uh, David Reich uh, lecture, and then we will open uh, uh, the session for a uh, discussion. So I welcome the first lecture, Svante Pablo, please. So thank you very, very much, Israel. And thank you very much for the great honor to be here. I'm very honored to receive this prize, the Don David Prize, and to be back in Israel after 20 years of absence, actually. It's wonderful to be here. So um, you should see, I should try to find my presentation, which is presumably on here. Mm. David Reich presentation, that's not very good. I don't want to do that. Uh, right there, looks like something useful. Um, so, um, what I then wanted to start out with here, since uh, the audience is presumably a bit mixed, and please indicate if I move too far away from the microphone or something so you don't hear me. I just wanted to start out by reminding you about what you all know, right? that our genome is stored in every cell in our body on the chromosomes, and every cell in the body in principle contains the same genome. So it doesn't matter from what part of the body you, you study your genome. And this genome is of particular interest to us what happens in the germline when germ cells are born so you have a chance to create a new generation. And what then happens is that there are enzymatic, uh, uh, enzymatic machinery that unwinds these two strands from the famous double helical molecule, 
and two new strands are formed. Let's see, I can point to this here. And that happens in a very exact process, but nothing is totally exact, of course. Sometimes an incorrect base is built in. So there are four, four letters or bases used here. E, A, T, and C, and opposite to C should be an A, a T, <laughs> a G, and an A is built in instead. And if that is not repaired quickly enough before the cell divides again, that will appear as an error. It's a mutation. And we see the results of such mutations when we compare DNA sequences between people as a difference between two genomes that we study here, for example. So if we compare two human genomes, we have a difference in the order of every thousand bases or so. And these errors sort of rain down on the genome in every generation, so that if we compare a human genome to a chimpanzee, we find in the order of 10 times more differences, about one every hundred in bases. And so what you do if you're interested in the history of a particular part of our genome or a whole genome is to reconstruct the most likely history that gives rise to this pattern of differences you see. And in this case, it's of course very simple. The two human DNA sequences have a common ancestor quite recently here, and they share a common ancestor with the chimpanzees much further back. So you also know that the human genome contains around 3 billion such Basis. So there is a lot of history, a sort of lot of patterns of past mutations there to try to reconstruct history. So if you do that in terms of humans now, study genetic variation in the human genome on a genome-wide scale, what you will find is that you find the most variation in Africa. So although there are a lot less people living in Africa than outside Africa, on average, two Africans have more differences between them than two people outside Africa. And not only that, most genetic variants that you find outside Africa here has close relatives inside Africa. But there is then a component, if you like, of the gene pool in Africa that have no close relatives outside. And that is sort of the overall pattern that is sort of the genetic basis for the idea that modern humans evolved in Africa, accumulated genetic differences there, and a part of that variation, so to say, went out and colonized the rest of the world. And with genetic tricks, you can also estimate approximately when that happened, and it's sort of quite recently in evolutionary terms, less than 100,000 years ago or so, when humans spread all across Asia and Europe and to elsewhere. So that is sort of the recent African origin model for modern humans, but there is a problem with that model, if you like. And that is the fact that we know there were other forms of humans around there since quite a long time. Most famously then Neanderthals in the Middle East, in, in Europe and Western Asia, and in Asia then other forms of what we call archaic humans that are less well described. So our interest is then to study the genomes of these guys, but they are then extinct, so we'll have to go and study DNA from old remains. And that goes back then to work that started in the early 80s, actually, with studying ancient Egyptian mummies that are then two, three thousand years old, where it was possible to then show that in some mummies, you can sort of say in the basal layers of the skin here, see something that looks like cell nuclei, which are the part of the cell where DNA should be preserved. And you can also show that you can stay in these nuclei with dyes for DNA. And at about the same time, in 84, Alan Wilson at UC Berkeley demonstrated that DNA could survive in old tissues in a hundred year old extinct form of a quagga from South Africa. And I then went on to clone the DNA from this mummy and publish a DNA sequence from it. And then over the next couple of years, it became more and more clear that that sequence was for sure not an old sequence. It was probably a DNA sequence from me or a museum curator or something like that. 
Uh, what I still believe is that this DNA you see in the cell nuclei here is sort of old, but this turned out to not be right. And the reason for that is, of course, that DNA is not that stable a molecule. So if you now compare how much DNA you can extract from fresh tissues or from ancient tissues, there is in the order of 10,000 to a million fold less DNA per gram surviving in old tissues than in present day tissues. In addition, this DNA is uh, degraded to short fragments and it's chemically modified. And an additional problem is then that the vast majority of the DNA in an old bone or a mummy doesn't come from the old individual or organism at all. It comes from bacteria or fungi that colonize the bones after the death of the thing. And this, of course, means that if you study human remains and tiny amounts of contamination that might come in or always come in when you study um, present-day DNA, it's so vanishingly small amounts compared to the endogenous DNA that it never appears in your analysis. But the same amount of DNA when you study these ancient remains may overwhelm your experiments. And that's what happened with the first mummy for sure. So there was a whole period of many years of being, becoming more and more paranoid about contamination and sort of dressing up in funny clothes and having special labs and filtering the air and so on and so on. And the initial work was also much focused on a tiny part of the genome only, the mitochondrial genome that's inherited from mother to offspring and has the advantage that it occurs many, many copies per cell. So it's a bigger chance that some of it will survive. So there was a long period then of, of retrieving mitochondrial DNA from recent zoological collections from the last hundred years going back to animals that have become recently extinct, like the marsupial wolf, 100, 150 years ago, animals such as the ground sloth or mammoths that disappeared, most of them during the last glaciation. But our interests are then particularly extinct forms of humans, particularly then Neanderthals to the left here compared to a present day human. And one can ask, why are we so obsessed with Neanderthals, I think for, from my point of view, in a way, one reason is that they are the closest extinct relative of all present-day humans. In some sense, if we should define ourselves biologically as a group, it's them we should compare ourselves to. You may also be interested in, of course, their history, what happened when they met modern humans, are they part of our ancestry and so on. And that is something that had been discussed in anthropology for decades with all kinds of ideas going from one idea largely coming from genetic data actually saying it was a total replacement. Modern humans appeared in Africa, replaced everyone else, zero percent contribution from Neanderthals to say present day Europeans to another extreme view of saying total continuity, the Neanderthals would be the direct ancestors of present-day Europeans and every shade in between. So the first chance to test that then came in the early 90s, where we got the chance to sample not just any Neanderthal, but sort of the type specimen that was found in Neanderthal in 1856 and gave its name to this group of humans from the upper arm there, looked at the mitochondrial genome, then a particularly variable part of it, and estimated such a tree that I showed you in the beginning, then based for the mitochondrial DNA. And what we then found was that the mitochondrial DNA of the Neanderthals here go back to a common ancestor quite far back, over or about half a million years ago, shared with all the mitochondrial genomes of all humans today. So it falls clearly outside the variation of present-day humans and one looked at tens of thousands of present-day humans and in the meantime many Neanderthals. So in the terms of these models this is total replacement. There is no human today running around with a Neanderthal mitochondrial genome. But it's also clear of course that the mitochondrial genome is just a tiny part of our history. 
is only maternal inherited and as one unit, so there's a lot of chance in how it is passed on to the next generation. The total picture is clearly in the nuclear genome. And I think I'm quoted in some newspaper somewhere 2002 saying we will never get a nuclear genome from a Neanderthal. It's too little there, it's too degraded, it can't be done. Which just goes to say you should never make negative predictions, I guess, <laughs> because you're generally or often proven wrong. And what proves you wrong is generally technology that goes fast. And what came around was this first generation of high throughput DNA sequencing that allows you to sequence millions and billions of DNA molecules really cheaply and inexpensively. So you could start just extracting all the DNA from such a fossil, not try to retrieve then some particular mitochondrial fragments or so, but just sequence all the DNA that's there, start comparing it to the human genome that was in the meantime sequenced, and see what fragments might come from Neanderthals. First place where this worked was in southern Europe, in Croatia, this site. And this bone, actually, uh, this part of the bone that the person holds there. The first thing that you will notice when you do this is indeed there are short fragments. It's degraded to short fragments, 40, 50, 60 bases. From a modern DNA, you can easily get 10,000, 20,000 uh, bases, long fragments. Uh, only a tiny part of the DNA our best bones at the time are something like 3 or 4 percent endogenous DNA. All the rest is then bacterial and fungal and so on. And we were then very lucky to be funded for a five-year period for improved techniques to retrieve DNA. So over five years, we got a lot better in the methods with which we extract the DNA, convert it into a form that you can feed into these sequencing machines. We looked through many sites, many bones, and focused on three bones from that site in Croatia, and sequenced a bit over a billion DNA sequences from it, which sounds a lot, but today it's rather little actually compared to what you can do. And the vast majority of them, of course, comes from bacteria, but there were enough of them so that we could sort of start mapping them to the human genome taking into account that there are these particular errors typical of ancient DNA in them. And then by 2010, we sort of had a first overview over the genome, where we had a little over half of the genome that we had seen at least once. And that's one of the questions we were then interested in, is what happened when Neanderthals met modern humans? Did they done mix or not? And that's where we started collaborating with with David of asking these types of questions. And we asked that since it was such a controversial question, we asked, tried to answer it in several different ways. The most intuitive one, perhaps, is to say that if it is so that when modern humans came out of Africa and met Neanderthals and they mixed, then we would expect Europeans today to share more genetic variants with Neanderthals than people in Africa, where Neanderthals have never been. So it's simply this idea here, if there is no mixture here, then Neanderthal is equally far from a person in Africa as a person in Europe. If there is a contribution here, on average, Europeans will be closer to Neanderthals than Africans will be here. You can ask that in a very simple way. We had the Neanderthal genome, we had five genomes we sequenced from different parts of the world, and did a very simple test. To test this first, two Africans, just looking for positions where they differ from each other, and say, how often does a Neanderthal match this African or that African? And since there is no reason to assume that Neanderthals have contributed to any Africans, it should be 50-50. And indeed, statistically speaking, that's what it is. What we then compared a European individual to an African individual, to my surprise, I must say, was that we found significantly more matching to the European individual than the African individual, suggesting that there had been a contribution here. 
Even more surprising was that when we looked in a Chinese individual versus Africa, we again see more contribution, although most people would say Neanderthals had never been in China. And Papua New Guinea, where for sure Neanderthals had never been, we again see this. So the model that was sort of then suggested that has since been proven right, actually, in its big features, is to say that when modern humans come out of Africa, they presumably pass somewhere in this region in the Middle East. We know there were Neanderthals here. So if these Neanderthals then mixed with early modern humans that went on to become ancestors of many or most people outside Africa, these people, when they spread, could sort of carry with them this Neanderthal contribution to the entire rest of the world, even parts where there had never been Neanderthals. So to the extent then that between 1 and 2 percent of your ancestry, if your roots are outside Africa, come from Neanderthals. So since then we have gone on and worked, particularly with Russian colleagues at this site in southern Siberia, the Niseva Cave, it's a beautiful place actually, where they in 2010 found this little toe bone that turned out to be very well preserved and had also improved our methods to retrieve DNA dramatically, primarily by a, a method we actually start by denaturing the DNA, so separating the two DNA strands so that each strand has independent chance to end up in the libraries. So, and that has turned out to be quite important since in these old samples often there are modifications that make it impossible to retrieve the molecule, but they're often, say, confined to one strand only, so the other strand will then have a chance to come over. So that allowed us to go from a Neanderthal genome where we had just a little over half of it to a Neanderthal genome where we have sequenced on average every position 50 times over. So we have now for the parts of the genome to which we can map these short little fragments of very high quality genome. So where every position is seen. So you can now, for example, look at different people who live today. So this would just be for one chromosome, this would be different individuals here, and indicated in red would be the fragments inferred to come from Neanderthals. The one thing that you will see is that different people generally carry different fragments from Neanderthals. On average, that adds up to something like 1 to 2 percent per person. You may ask sort of naively, is that a lot or is it a little? And it's sort of a funny question, but just to get a perspective on that perhaps, you could think about your own family tree perhaps and say, you, of course, have 50% of your DNA from your mother and father, 25 on average from a grandparent, 12%, 6%, 3%, and 1.5% six generations back. So it is as if one Neanderthal ancestor, six generations back among your 64 ancestors there. If it was six generations back, it would be differently distributed. It would be in huge, huge chunks, but in the sort of amount of it, that's what it corresponds to. So you may then also ask how much of the Neanderthal genome is still around today, walks on two legs in people today. If you sort of go and jump from individual to individual, how much can you put together? The jury is still a bit out on that, but it's for sure 40 percent, maybe half of the genome or so is, is still around, probably more even. What they also found at that cave site in Siberia in 2008 already was a tiny little bone, a fragment of the last phalanx of a pinky of a child that turned out to also be well preserved. So we were able to retrieve a good genome also from this and we obviously thought it would be a Neanderthal or maybe a modern human. So we were extremely surprised to find that it was not a Neanderthal, not a modern human, but something else that was quite deeply diverged from Neanderthals. So, so it's sort of quite distant, so if they say the deepest population split among present-day humans is something like 100,000 years back, this is about four times deeper. After a lot of debate, we sort of decided to call these guys the Nisovans, and after this 
Tait, the Nisiva cave, where they were first found. To this date, there are only four physical remains, sort of at least published from them, three teeth and this little phalanx here, only from this site. But we have sort of good indications that they have been more widespread in the past, because if you then look for contributions from the Nisivans to present-day people, you do find a contribution, and you find it all over Asia in low amounts, below 1%. But in the Pacific, say Papua New Guinea, Aboriginal Australians, you find up to 5% of their genome coming from the Nisivans. And that's presumably because the Nisivans were somewhere where the ancestors of people in Oceania met them, in Southeast Asia or something like that. So one sort of message from this is that one has always mixed with each other. Modern humans are mixed with these other forms, at least a little bit. And we've also gotten recently a reminder of that from this site in Romania, where speleologists found this mandible that looks like a modern human mandible uh, in 2010, I believe. Uh, and when we studied the genome of this individual, we were quite surprised. So this is now looking on only one chromosome, looking at some other modern humans indicating in color fragments that are of Neanderthal origin. And since this individual is 40,000 years old now, lived at a time when Neanderthals were still around, we were very interested in had it mixed with Neanderthals or not. And the answer to that was, yes, indeed, it had, and it contains a lot more Neanderthal DNA than people today. And in reality, where there are black things here, we have no data. So this seems that for this chromosome, over half the chromosome is solidly of Neanderthal origin. That, of course, means there was a Neanderthal closely related to this individual back in the family tree. There are seven such regions across the genome, and you can show that that means that six, five, or four generations back was there a Neanderthal ancestor here. So we almost caught them in the act, if you like. So when modern humans then spread out of Africa and across Africa, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future one finds that there was admixture also with archaic forms in Africa, there's some indication of that from present-day variation. One spread across Asia, that's still debated, but there's probably, I would guess, there were several cases of admixture there too, at least with the Nisivans. And we then know that it happened locally also in southern Europe. So, sort of in terms of this model, we clearly sort of rejected the total replacement model. There was a contribution, but the big picture is, of course, still replacement out of Africa. We sort of like to sort of call this model like leaky replacement or so, to keep in the perspective that, yes, most of our genetic variation come out of Africa, but there is some contribution from these archaic forms and outside Africa. And there is, of course, an interesting area now of research to find out how these interactions happen. And I, think that we will be able to sort of address that perhaps quite well at many sites in the future, also sites where you don't find human remains, because of recent work that then shows that you can use sediments, at least from cave sites, to retrieve DNA just from soil samples such as these. So Vivian Sloan, who comes from here, one of Israel's students, who we are very happy to have with us, uh, I studied a number of cave sites and shown that you can retrieve DNA of animals and hominins from all upper Paleolithic sites, late Paleolithic sites is tested. For middle Paleolithic sites, it's only in one case so far that she has been successful. But that means then that we can hope to sort of in the future go through a stratigraphy and as not only look at bones, but also from sediments, identify hopefully who has lived there. And in the Nisiva cave, for example, find that yes, both the Nisivans and Neanderthals have been there at different times, replacing presumably each other. <laughs>
So this is then Vivian who's sort of done this work and comes from this university. So for the last part here, for the last 10 minutes or so, I would like to shift gears a little bit and sort of ask, well, so there is this contribution then from Neanderthals and the Nisivans to present day people. One could say, who cares? Does it matter for us today at all? So is there a functional contribution from these archaic groups to people today? And it's almost every month we learn more and more about this now. So if you walk across the genome, and this is a slide from some of David's work, for example, in Europeans here, across the whole genome, and plot places where there is contribution from Neanderthals, you will see it's generally just a few percent of people carry it. But there are also things where many people today carry Neanderthal variants. And some of them are unique to Europe, not in Asia, some are unique to Asia, and some are also shared. So you can begin to ask, what do you find in these places? So, just to give you an example, there are contributions then from Neanderthals. For example, a variant of a gene that is a lipid transporter that confers risk for type 2 diabetes, so the type of diabetes you get at old age. And you find this as quite high frequency, 25-30% of people in Asia and in Native Americans carry this. So it may then be, seem surprising that something that gives you a problem today type 2 diabetes would have risen to high frequency. Why wouldn't it be selected against? And I think there is sort of good reason to assume that genetic variants that today give us a problem when we eat too much during our entire life, gives us diabetes, may be actually of an advantage in a situation of starvation, where you may be more efficient in retrieving nutrition. So this variant clearly comes from Neanderthals, and it's sort of reasonable to assume then that it's some kind of Neanderthal adaptation to starvation that have come over and been of an advantage in early modern humans. The Nisivans have also contributed. We're beginning to learn more of that. Just one example, in, at high altitudes in the Tibet, people are adapted to living where there's little oxygen in the atmosphere. It was already known that the most important genetic adaptation to that, that is in a gene called EPAS1 that has to do with how much oxygen you can take up in the blood without increasing your red blood cell count, which results in problems with blood clots and things like that. Rasmus Nielsen's group at Berkeley showed that this variant that exists in about 80% frequency in Tibet that variant comes over from the Nisivans or something closely related to the Nisivans into the ancestor of Tibetans. It's sort of fascinating to think that we would perhaps not have so big populations on the Tibetan plateau if it wasn't for this contribution from some Neanderthal-like group. Some things seem to have been so important so that they've come over several times, actually, from Neanderthals and the Nisivans. One example is a toll-like receptor complex. So these are receptors on the surface of uh, white blood cells that are important for how you fight, uh, say, viruses or things in innate immunity. And there are variants there that are closely related, come from Neanderthals, others that come from the Nisivans. So these have come over several times and risen in frequency. You find them in this typical pattern outside Africa, not inside Africa. If it's in, inside Africa, it's presumably associated with gene flow back into Africa. You can then look at people today that are homozygous for these Neanderthal variants and they ex express higher levels of these receptors than people who don't have the variants or are heterozygous for it, have two copies of it. And you can see what this is associated with in sort of uh, genome-wide association studies. So these Neanderthal and Denisovan variants are associated with increased resistance to Helicobacter pylori infections, a type of bacteria that gives you ulcers, 
If you don't have ulcer today in spite of a hectic life, you might thank the Neanderthals for that maybe. But these same variants then are associated with an increased risk for allergic problems. If you have allergies, maybe you should blame them. So there's a picture emerging where then these modern humans come out of Africa, they meet these archaic groups that have lived for hundreds of thousands of years in the environment in Asia and Europe, have adapted to those environments. One mixes a little bit with them, picks up variants that are sometimes then advantageous and they will increase in frequency. This is something we could call adaptive introgression. If you, and that's sort of becoming realized that that may have been quite important in early modern human evolution. But we should also not forget that most Neanderthal variants that one now finds comes from association studies where you find associations to different diseases today, hypercoagulation, blood clots, even psychiatric diseases and so on. Finally then, before we end, um, the thing that I am most interested in actually from this is in a way to study what was not contributed from Neanderthals. Because we can now sort of go over the genome chromosome by chromosome here and plot in red what comes from Neanderthals in Europe and in Asia. And we can ask other regions of the genome where we would statistically expect a contribution from Neanderthals, but we don't see it. And indeed, there are such regions that we tend to call deserts of Neanderthal contribution. So these are regions where it seems that we select against the contribution from them. We sort of don't want to accept it in our population. And that is really interesting to us because in some sense that may be where the genetic basis and for being a fully modern human resides. So genetic changes that appeared in humans since we separated from Neanderthals and that we somehow really select for. And why are we interested in this? Well, sort of naively because we modern humans maybe different opinions, this is scary, there are paleontologists and archaeologists here, um, but with modern humans, at least after a while, comes technology that starts changing rapidly and become regionalized in the world, whereas Neanderthal technology, say, to my naive understanding, was much more homogeneous and continuous over time, becomes figurative art, for example, and of course, modern humans are the first group of hominins that eventually become millions of people and spread across a whole habitable part of the planet until we are seven billion people today. So our bias is to say this has something to do with cognition or, or sociality in humans or something like that. And a dream would be that this has something to do with genetic changes we could potentially identify here that are shared in all present day people today, but Neanderthals don't have them. So we can make this catalog now. We have the genome, at least for the two thirds that are then a single copy of the genome. And the amazing thing is that that list is not very long. It's around 30,000 changes. So whereas if you compare two genomes between people today, between you and me, we have something like three million differences between us. But if we make the requirement that everyone today should share something and Neanderthals should not have it, it's just around 30,000. You can look through it in an afternoon in the computer and your problem is you don't understand what you look at at all. I mean, the dirty little secret, I may say so, of Genomics is that we're incredibly bad at just from a DNA sequence infer anything about how we function or how we think or, or anything like that. But that's of course I think where we are going, much of the field is going and, and this is really an interesting question to me. So I just want to give you a flavor for this perhaps by just focusing on a tiny part of this 96 changes that change amino acids in proteins in the molecules that actually perform functions in our body. So you can list those proteins that have these changes. Again, it's a problem to say, what does this mean? So 
we have a bias, of course, in saying which of these changes would be important is that we think it should have to do with the development of the brain or the function of the brain. So one way to ask this is then to say which of these proteins with amino acid changes in, are they overexpressed in any part of the brain relative to control that would be genes that have silent changes that don't change amino acids but that are found in the same way. And there is one part of the sort of developing brain where there is an overexpression of these things. It's a sort of proliferative part where uh, stem cells divide. And very strikingly, these are small numbers. There are just five proteins expressed there, but three of them are actually part of the spindle and the kinetochore, so the machinery that pulls the chromosomes apart when they divide. So, you know, I mean, I was extremely surprised. I would have thought that cell division would be something extremely conserved that wouldn't have changed in humans since Neanderthals. We waved our hands and sort of started saying, well, maybe, you know, the cleavage plane of cells during brain development is known to be very important. When the stem cells divide here to make, if the cleavage plane is homogeneous, there will be two new stem cells. If it's oblique, it will form one neuron and one stem cell. But that was pure speculation, but they're beginning to have handles to studying this. So there are these new technology of induced pluripotent stem cells where you can take cells, de-differentiate them, and then make them not only into neurons, but into brain-like organoids that are like a developing human brain. So if you compare, and this is work that has been done then in our department, compare these organoids to fetal brain, they are very similar. What you can also do then is make these organoids from chimpanzees, our closest living relative, and compare them to present-day humans. And they are very similar in how the brain is being formed. But there are some differences. And particularly if you then look at the dividing cells here, which are those cells that form either neurons or other stem cells, and follow with imaging how they divide, comparing a human and a chimpanzee. You will see the chromosomes here, and you will see them after a while lining up and being pulled apart. And here it happened already, and there it happens there. And quite surprisingly, what we found was that there was actually a difference here. In humans, this phase, when they line up, is longer than it is in the chimpanzee, significantly longer and particularly in the stem cells that form neurons. We don't see this difference in other cell divisions, in other tissues between humans and chimpanzees. So it's sort of tempting to say there is something here, and that that could have to do with these changes that is a difference not only to chimpanzees, but also to the Neanderthals then. So what, where one now wants to go in the next future is, of course, to put these changes into the genome of a human stem cells and make these organoids and see if there is a difference in cell division here, and also to put these things into a mouse. And if I have two, three minutes more, I would then like to sort of say that, sort of illustrate how one may also use the mouse as a model in the future to, to do these things. And that then comes from work on one gene that was identified not from the Neanderthal genome, but from other work, where other groups that identified a gene called FOXP2 that has to do with language development in a family where there is a serious language problem, that specific language problem that segregates over three generations. And they identified the gene, Tony Monaco's group in Oxford, and we then discovered that this gene, or they already discovered that this gene encodes a transcription factor whose function it is then to turn off and on other genes. And there are two amino acid changes in this otherwise very conserved protein it encodes that is specific to humans and not there in apes. So we were very interested when we got the Neanderthal and the Nisivan genome to see 
what was the state at these positions that might then have something to do with language ability. And it turned out that the Neanderthals and Denisovans looked like humans. So these changes, whatever they do, happen before we diverge from Neanderthals. But we've now studied this gene over the last nine years. It's a good example for how one might study human-specific things in the future, I think. So this protein is very conserved from human to mouse. So what you can do is replace in the mouse this little part of the gene that contains the human-specific changes. There's another change here that presumably have no function. So what you then have is a mouse that from its own FOXP2 gene makes a human protein with those changes that might be interesting. So you have this mouse and you then have your next problem is you think this should have something to do with language and speech. You try to talk to your mouse and you do it for a long time and probably its life span is not long enough to really learn language. But you have an animal model anyway that you can begin to study. So, for example, you can then look at the morphology of neurons. And what we found was that the humanized mice, compared to wild-type litter mates, born by the same mother, have longer dendritic trees, so longer connections to other nerve cells. And you find that particularly in parts of the brain that has to do with motor learning, corticobasal ganglion circuits, and not in other parts of the brain. So that then led a graduate student to move on to Boston, to Anne Graybill's lab, to study motor learning in these humanized mice. So these are then tests where they have the mouse in a maze, and they have something the mouse really likes here, chocolate milk. And you give it a cue, say with a lamp, that it should go towards the lamp to get it. There is no difference between the humanized mice and their litter mates in how quickly they learn that the light is important. But it then comes a time when you can take away the lamp. If you always give the signal to the left, it comes a time when you can take away the lamp and the mouse is simply internalized. I always go to the left and I get my chocolate milk. And that the humanized mice learn in seven to eight days, whereas take their litter mate 11 to 12 days to learn the same thing. So this is what uh, the neurobiologists would say is a switch from declarative to procedural learning. There is also other evidence neurobiologically from the mice that this is what is affected. And I'm not really a neurobiologist, but they tell me that sort of think about when you learn to bike as a kid. When you begin to do it, you think about what you do and you're very bad at it. It's very complicated, right? If I lean towards this, I should actually steer to that side to compensate for that, etc. And you're terrible at it. But it comes a point when you stop thinking about what you do. And that is the point when you're suddenly good at biking. And that is this switch then from declarative to procedural learning. It's also switch in the striatum from the medial to the lateral part. And that switch we also see in the mice, actually. So the idea is then that these two amino acid changes affect something in these circuits that has to do with motor learning and the speculate makes it more efficient and the speculation is that the most sophisticated motor coordination problem we do as humans is articulate speech. That we need millisecond control between vocal cords, lips, tongues to produce articulate speech. So that this may actually be a sort of adaptation to articulation. This then illustrates that I think sometimes these animal models, even mice, can be useful to try to understand what human-specific changes do. This is still just a hypothesis, but it's something one can now pursue, also say in families with mutations in this FOXP2 gene. I think this is very encouraging for other genes that may have to do with brain function and brain development and that have interesting human-specific changes since the Neanderthals. So to just end up then, I sort of hope I convinced you that if you're interested in human evolution, particularly recent human evolution, it's very good to have 
the Neanderthal genome because you can sort of see what's changed in humans since we're separated from Neanderthals. In the future also what's typical to, for Neanderthals when there are more Neanderthal genomes. But that one interesting direction then for the future is to take the next step and say, what are the functional implications of these things? And that will involve then introducing these changes into stem cells and looking at their effects when you differentiate them into different tissues or cell types, but also using animal models such as humanized mice. And I should then end by saying that there are many, many people that have evolved, been involved in this, many more than I can mention. There are many groups that contributed uh, samples to us, particularly important are, of course, uh, Anatoly Derevyanko and his colleagues in Russia with the specimens from which these high quality genomes are done. We now have a high quality Neanderthal genome also from Croatia contributed by these people. I mentioned one person by name, Matthias Meyer, who sort of developed the techniques that has made it possible for us to do these high quality genomes that really allows us to study all parts of the single copy parts of the genome in, in great detail. Without these technological advances, we would not be where we are today. There have been many people involved in analyzing the data, many more people than I can mention. I do mention a few. In Leipzig, Janet Kelso, who coordinates all the bioinformatics, and Kai Prufer, who sort of coordinated the analysis of the Neanderthal genome. David Rice, whom you will soon get to know at the Broad and Montes Latkin and his group at Berkeley. And with that, I should mention also that our groups we work together with on the functional part, particularly Barbara Treutlein and her group at our institute, in our department, and Wieland Huttner in, in Dresden on some of the mouse work that we do. And with that, I thank you for your attention.